You mentioned just simply the practical treating of the deep fascia tissue to try to desensitize mm -hmm. it. I mean, you know, just to put words to it, are you just simply deep transverse friction, deep manual stripping? Yes. I mean, yes, stripping and torturing um, this poor man to death. Well, <laughs> to some degree. And uh, using shearing well. forces to try to um, restore, and also then um, um, traction to help relax the joint, to relax the leg, etc. And he does report some improvement, especially a response, uh, a, a relaxation of the leg, which he says makes it easy for him to walk, and so on. But I'm example, still, I mean, he I has a consult. Him, yeah. I mean, I saw him this morning and mm -hmm. he said, you know, that one of the, the functional things he said was before when I would get up, it would take me at least a hundred yards of kind of moving to get mm -hmm. any kind of a regular walk, a regular gait. He said now within 10 feet, it's just, it turns mm -hmm. regular and it's automatic. I don't have to really feel or think about it anymore. Oh, uh, good. So he says he does feel a functional difference. And mm -hmm. I mean, in one sense too, I think whether it's hope, <laughs> he, he wants to continue treatment consistently. Mm -hmm. And I would think mm -hmm. like, you know, I've seen him now for a couple for maybe six weeks. And if mm -hmm. he wasn't actually in fact feeling improvement, he wouldn't keep coming. He wouldn't pay, and he wouldn't keep no. <laughs> like so. No, he, must, he wouldn't. He must be experiencing relief or or, or, or improvement. Yes, yes. And I, I do truly actually believe see that. changes of, and I do see mm -hmm. not a lot, but I see a change in the range of motion in his knee. Not mm -hmm. only within the visit, which I could make a significant mm -hmm. change within the visit, but like mm -hmm. you said, when he comes back, it's essentially back. But from when I started six weeks ago to today, mm -hmm. there is a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. above 90. His his limit was above 90 degrees at knee flexion. Mm -hmm. Now it's below 90 degrees of knee flexion, mm -hmm. starting. Mm -hmm. in, so. Yes. So I think he's a very interesting case. And um, yes, I think that having been in PT for 10 months, he wouldn't know if he was making any change or not. He would not continue. And I told him that. I said... I don't want you to waste your resources because right. if we are not going to make a difference, then why, why yeah. bother? We need to move you in the direction of better um, diagnostics and find a doctor who is interested enough to actually consider other possibilities and causes for your problem and what might be underneath you know i mean maybe they should um uh, place him again under anesthesia and this time um fully flex the knee <laughs> brace it in flexion and then wake him up <laughs> that way and see if the tissue will tolerate the stretch when it has been maximally flexed and then he wakes up because these tissues will then have to respond to an alert brain and record the position that's an interesting that they're in. experiment yeah. you'd like to well run. yeah you know <laughs> because it's important to think outside yeah. the box in yeah. these cases yeah. because if under if when he's awake he cannot allow you to do this then it is possible to 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 um use the very neurological mechanism which is his unconscious letting go should be put to use and um uh, maybe under twilight he can be mobilized and slowly brought out whilst he's still moving so that there's no sudden uh alert to the brain to um stop him so there are options which can still be entertained but we need a doctor who is interested and committed 
to um, thinking outside the box. So we'll see. Um, I'll keep just you posted. just to say it a bit page. more, yeah, thank you, obviously. I mean, you, you're treating him once or twice a week, and I'm treating him once or twice a week, and kind of uh, mm -hmm. obviously different days. So we're kind of reporting back and forth. Reporting each other back and, and forth. He's reporting mm -hmm. back. Um, mm -hmm. And just to kind of, for my own for my own sake and everyone else's sake listening, I mean, in the office, what I could tell you what I'm doing, you know, pra mm -hmm. practically speaking. He comes in. Mm -hmm. I go through a little bit of an examination, obviously. I'm checking his low back. I'm screening out his low back. I'm screening out his pelvis, hips, and lower quarter. Uh, then if his low back needs some specific treatment, we do some. Uh, similarly uh, to the pelvis. Then I look at his hip and I look at his knee and I'm doing some manual work, some, try, some mm -hmm. essentially some contract, relax, post-isometric relaxation, some mm -hmm. type of manual stretching to try to restore capacity and range of motion in the knee, which it does happen. I mean, there's a significant improvement mm -hmm. in knee flexion. At that point, I start to work him in DNS developmental strategies or positions where either that lower extremity is in a position of support. That's where we usually start. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For me, I have him actually on his foot, so in a staggered position um, off mm -hmm. the table, where mm -hmm. he's doing essentially like a uh, a guided uh, lunge, uh, mm -hmm. where his he's supporting on his problem hip and problem foot, uh, mm -hmm. and I also put him on a uh, a little bench that I have pretty mm -hmm. low. So he's mm -hmm. starting essentially in a deep squat position. Mm -hmm. I let him either grab my hands or grab a bar that I'm holding, and he mm -hmm. will shift his weight over his feet, keep the knees mm -hmm. and everything in a good quality position, and he uprights from the deep squat position. Mm -hmm. And once okay. he comes up, he drops back down, and he mm -hmm. tries to get his butt to touch that bench three times. Mm -hmm. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit of a pumping up and down, and mm -hmm. then finally press mm -hmm. down through your feet, come up. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of that. So some weight bearing on the foot, loading it back and forth in a squat or a lunge pattern. Mm -hmm. And since he saw you, I've been also using like the prone positions of a crawl, where mm -hmm. either we're moving that problem hip and leg through a phasic function where I'm getting him to try mm -hmm. to flex the hip maximally and mm -hmm. extend it maximally in addition mm -hmm. to flexing and extending his knee, or we're, we've got him on his knee in a prone support position on the problem knee. And he's using, he's moving back and forth through the problem knee in a staggered kind of crawl position. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, and that's pretty much it. You know, I mean, okay. one, I mean, that one, seems it's uh you know and in one sense it's like well that's all there is to do really i mean i can mm -hmm, put him in mm -hmm. a support function and a phasic function in a variety of weight bearing position i see uh, so yeah so you know uh, um well he comes in i screen his back as i always do i make sure i uh, i palpate it and then um the last time i did use some uh dry needling to um, to relax into the his, paraspinals, uh, the paraspinals, no, into the paraspinals. I did that. And then I, um, I moved the fascia, the deep fascia around his leg, his thigh, uh, uh, both superficial and deep, the fascia lata, um, the uh, tissues around the collateral ligaments. He has some tenderness into the calf, and uh, I do uh, some flossing of the tibial nerve um, and into the foot, um, uh, releasing the intrinsics of the arch of the foot. And then Look we uh, mobilize the patella. The <laughs> we mobilize the patella. And then I am also um, trying to improve the glide. Uh, of the the shear between the tibia and the femur because that is so restricted 
and uh, the tissue around the it's as if as if the thin tissue around the tibial plateau is glued to the bone. It really doesn't move very well. The uh, attachments of the collateral ligaments are pretty tender. So those are what I work on. I'm using the uh, four and a half month crawling, alternating crawling position, because I have found it very, very useful, um, which for many years just eluded me. I don't know why I didn't. I, I used to put people in four and a half month and just go, okay, what am I going to do with this position? But um, now I have found it really useful because, um, again, working with the chains has allowed me to explore what it is I want out of the position, how to make it dynamic, and really to help people who don't uh, feel their abdominals, especially in prone, or use them in prone, to start using them, especially in conjunction with the oblique chains. So it's now come alive to me, and I really enjoy... Um, using it, I use it on chronic pain patients who would otherwise be forced to do a supine, you know, bed dying bug kind of, mm-hmm. was I going to say bed bug, but no dying <laughs> bug kind of exercise. But in this uh, reversed position, it is a very good exercise and I'm enjoying using it a lot more. It's so interesting. Um, the uh, just a little side, like for my own personal use, mm-hmm. when I over the last six months, when I've kind of done my own little warm ups to workouts mm-hmm. where I'm using all the prone positions, mm-hmm. I can, you know, I, I can feel the chain, mm-hmm. the oblique chain pulling on me. Mm-hmm. Just, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just a sim, I mean, I say simple, but a simple quadruped kind of bird dog take mm-hmm. the opposite arm and leg as soon mm-hmm. as i attempt to move the opposite arm and leg i can feel mm-hmm. the stability mm-hmm. oblique chain pull tight mm-hmm. and kick I in think, yeah oh, God, oh, yeah i mean this is whereas i don't feel that when i'm in supine you know mm-hmm. it, it, no. the prone position there's something with them that, yes. yeah it's obviously just inherently harder that you feel these things, and it, yes. particularly if you're paying attention or you're aware of them. It's like, yes. okay, yeah, that is an oblique chain pulling and holding, and I could feel it wanting to either give or, mm-hmm. you know, me revert to an arched back position or something uh, yeah. to, to accommodate for it. So I can see. Yes, I think very- that when you have to establish a fixed point outside the body, it really calls upon you to feel or explore these stabilizing chains. And um, um, with that, it is possible to then go through the developmental sequence, explaining which chain, first oblique, second oblique, lateral, transverse, which chains are involved in the movement as you go, and which ones are emphasized in uh, alternating phasic function, and which chains are all uh, are, are involved in stabilizing the body during the phasic uh, move. So that has been really fascinating. I attempted to do it at the C course um, in Indiana, which uh, I thought was helpful. Um, and so um, going back to him, yes, that's those are the things I do. And um, activating stabilization um, in different positions. I'm, so I'm also waiting uh, because what I need is more information from the surgical report. I would like I'll to know. Him. Yes, I, because I don't want to push him and cause him discomfort if I don't need to. And that will be based on what the findings are, his consultation, which he um, has with uh, the specialist coming up. Um, I think it's been moved because, um, unfortunately, he's been tested positive for COVID. So he has to, uh, yeah. So anyway, but that is uh, an exciting um, uh, patient. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more like it, 
then please like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also stay up to date on our latest seminars on our social media pages on Instagram and Facebook, at IMTR Seminars.